Hi, listeners. We want to tell you about a podcast we're really digging. It's called Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio. Every week, they travel the world to find the most fascinating stories about food, including children who harvest cod tongues after school in Norway and a detective who tracks down food thieves. And on Milk Street Radio, you can always find the unexpected. The comedian who ranks apples using an elaborate 100-point system, the secret history of grocery stores, and how to eat your way through Italy. They also interview the most beloved names in food like Jacques Pepin, Sola Aueli, Jose Andres, Jettila, Ina Garten, Nigella Lawson, and Padma Lakshmi. Plus, co-hosts Christopher Kimball and Sarah Moulton do live calls with listeners and answer their questions about ingredients, techniques, and culinary mysteries. Like, why roasting a leg of lamb made one collar's oven explode? Ever wonder why your bread won't rise or your souffle falls flat? Chris and Sarah have the answers. You'll also hear from a rotating cast of contributors, including Kenji Lopez-Alt, Cheryl Day, Dan Pashman from The Sporkful, and Alex Inews, a French guy cooking from YouTube. Take a listen at 177milkstreet.com slash radio, or just search your podcast app for Milk Street Radio. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host. It's our 15th year, and we are so thrilled to be in Holyoke, Massachusetts. I'm on the road. Let's go around the room and then have our guests introduce themselves. Hello, this is Andrea Stanley, co-owner of Valley Malt and Ground Up Grain. Hello, I'm Kyle Fiescanero. I'm the owner and chef at Brewers Foods. Hi, I'm Matthew Steinberg, co-founder and head brewer at Exhibit A Brewing in Framingham, Massachusetts. Well, th this has been several years in, in the making. Um, some of our first grain and craft malt stories were with Andrea Stanley of Valley Malt, going way back to early days of, of grain market and regional grains. And uh, some of our first events with, with craft malt were all because of Andrea in New York. But fast forward, you know, the pandemic came and, and suddenly this, this little malt facility in Hadley, Mass was also making flour. And, um, you know, so many of the people that, that I know in this world, um, Tor Eschner out, out in the Finger Lakes, I've, I've met through through her network and right now we're eating some of their bread and we're going to drink some of the beer from from matt at exhibit a who's also using their malt and there's so many connections just at this table but i, I, I just I, I don't want to just say that i'm feeling really special being here with andrea and in, in her place and they expanded into holyoke so you guys are going to hear a story and and everyone's from kind of knows each other so thanks for listening okay andrea tell us a little bit about this this whole growth you know you you guys started out Malt. You were the first maltster in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Catch us up. You know, a few years later, you know where you are now. Sure. So, 2009, when we had the idea that, <clears throat> with the excitement around craft breweries that were in our in our state, um, we thought that you know supplying them with local malt could be a thing, but we weren't sure. So it was kind of a proof of concept for the first few years. And so we really didn't know what size kind of malt house we wanted to have. So we started pretty small in a neighbor's garage. And through 2010 to 2022, we remained in that garage in Hadley and really just expanded it as much as we possibly could. So we went from producing... Um, one ton batches to essentially um, four ton batches and then uh, just couldn't really squeeze any more into Hadley. And so we started looking in 2018 and it took us about three years to find a location for our new facility and another couple years to build it out. Um, but now we're in a awesome post-industrial city of Holyoke. So they've got all the utilities that a malt house would need, water, sewer, electric, um, and lots of room for us, 35,000 square feet to be able to put equipment, add equipment, put in a million pounds of grain storage, 
have the ability to clean grain, aggregate grain, hammer mill grain for distilleries, and also house our flour mill ground up where we're able to stone mill the same regionally sourced grains from farms like Oshner Farms. And um, yeah, it was a, it was really a great um, next step for us, even though it was big and kind of um, exhausting to do something like that. We, we love that we're here and, you know, have the ability to expand our businesses and grow in ways that um, the market is kind of signaling to us. So um, usually that's kind of been our growth strategy at Valley Mall for years. Just, you know, what can we get from local farms? Like what kind of quality, what kind of acreage? And then, you know, what is the market looking for? So, um, so that's kind of, you know, where we're still at, but we have the space to be able to make those changes and grow the businesses. Wow. It's so cool. And then Kyle, thanks for driving me out from Boston. Kyle, Kyle met me in Boston. We drove out and I've always wanted to come out here. Uh, it's Holyoke. It's kind of near Springfield. Um, and then with, with Matt from Exhibit A, I met you kind of through this whole network of, of grains. What, what do you say about Valley Malt and what they mean to you as a brewery and, and to this, the community of, uh, the brewers. Uh, yeah, I mean, I met Andrea and Christian um, when they were first getting started. They hadn't even built their first malt house yet. They were just kind of experimenting with it. And it was exciting for me to, to see that there was an opportunity to, uh, you know, buy locally sourced grain that otherwise wasn't available. Um, as a brewer, that was exciting for a variety of reasons. The big one was just being able to have something local, right? Like we talk about local beer all the time, but really the ingredients in the Northeast are pretty, uh, you know, relatively unavailable in those days. Uh, there's a couple of, you know, a couple of hop farmers and things like that, but really besides the water and the labor, there wasn't much local to be offered. Uh, so they gave us the opportunity to have, uh, you know, to shorten that supply chain and just buy grain from New York and Connecticut and Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Um, that was exciting um, that we quickly became friends, which I think was a big, you know, plus, you know, it's nice to really enjoy the time you have with your, your colleagues and, and suppliers. Um, I think the other piece that wasn't something I had anticipated was the creative outlet, being able to talk with Andrea and Chris about the grain that we were receiving and what we could do to make it better, to make it more efficient, better extract out of these grains, picking seeds that would deliver flavors and terroir that we were looking for for our beers. And more so moving forward, like instead of designing a beer based on the ingredients that were available, design the beer based, yes, on the grains that were available, but more so like, what can we do with that grain to make it this, right? And specialty malts like, um, like wheat was, was one that was a real challenge in terms of finding an interesting wheat to use. And, and Tor up in New York grows warthog and malting it here has delivered. I mean, it's, it's our wheat of choice, you know, and, uh, and stepping out of our kind of catalog looking selves, meaning like I go to the supplier's catalog and I'm like, I can pick this grain, this grain, and this one we were able to kind of facilitate and well, they were able to facilitate and help us develop grains that wouldn't otherwise exist. You know, and I think that was a real fun kind of opportunity for us as a young brewery and certainly a young industry of local malting. So. Andrew, some pointers about having a malt facility. I mean, I've never really been in one like this. Yeah. I mean, you had to grow into it. You know, pointers for others or, or selling points for yourself. Well, I think it's just like any, like, I mean, over the years, what I've realized is by being a maltster, you're, you know, you're a manufacturer. So understanding your process, understanding what it is that your customers want, understanding your raw materials and how to produce what your customers want from the raw materials that you have and do it in an efficient and cost effective manner. Um, and figuring out ways to stand out. So, you know, we figured out ways to stand out with some of the grains that we can procure, like Danko rye is an amazing grain that has, you know, so much flavor and character to it. Um, finding uh, ways to diversify. So starting our flour mill has really helped us to diversify and buy more grains from the farms that we work with. 
um, and put those into the food market. Um, but other really important things like, you know, having a clean facility, having good record keeping, um, understanding that you're a food manufacturer and you're not just, you know, making an ingredient that <clears throat> um, is not a food ingredient. Uh, so those are all, you know, things that we've learned over the years. And I would pass along to anybody that's thinking of starting up is, you know, you can't just do this with a shovel in your backyard. You need to have a little bit more food safety and, and uh, you know, some a uh, little bit more to it than maybe the early days. Well, it, it, it's qu quite a long, it's quite a ways in 10 years. I mean, 2014. 15 years. 15, we did the first event where you uh, came to New York and a number of New York brewers uh, used your malt. Mm -hmm. And um, there were so many questions then just about how to handle it in, in your brew system. And there was a lot of un unfamiliarity with it. To mm -hmm. Even in 2019, we, we did another uh, event with, with craft malt and brewers. And we had suddenly brewers from North Carolina to Maine that, that were not not only making beer with local malt, but, but local malt that was local to them. So it's, it's been a huge, huge change. When I walked in here earlier, uh, I was impressed at the, at the cleanliness. It, it, it shined, though. It, 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 I've been in the Zabres Hot Dog Factory in the, in the Bronx. That's not a good comparison, but it is, because that's the kind of place with meat you have to walk in, put on blue boots and, blue, and a blue hat. But this floor here was shining. Mm -hmm. You want to give credit to, to some of your staff that, that keep it so clean? Because oh, there must be a lot of dust from, from the processing. Yeah, we, I mean, dust is created, and it's also cleaned and, yeah, minimized. So, yeah, just our staff is, you know, really good at keeping things clean. Um, ahead of our head of facilities, Isis Feliciano is somebody who is always, you know, looking around, see something, just clean it up. Yeah, the, fl the floors glow here, and they're yeah. light blue. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah, and Kyle, for you, I know you 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 make and sell these crackers and, and spent grain. I mean, how do you feel being in a facility like this, or a repurposed? It was paper mill. At one point, it was a flour a flour mill or something, right? Mostly paper. Yeah. Yes. Um, as a small producer like myself, um, I see places like this, and it's wildly inspirational. Um, you see someone that had an idea and they didn't only just start a company and, you know, try it a little bit and maybe farm it out to someone else. They actually figured out how to make it um, um, purposeful and then they repurposed something that was going to be, you know, maybe torn down. But then they built it into a company that on, not only feeds their own family, but then feeds other people's families um, by selling the malt. Um, yeah, it's, it really is like, um, kind of like a, a Mecca of, of brewing ingredients yeah, in the Northeast. Yeah. You wanna, Andrew, you want to give a shout out to some of your small farmers, some that have been with you a long time? Well, certainly Oshner Farms that you mentioned. So Tor Oshner um, is somebody who not only grows grains for us, but helps us to work with other farmers that might not have the kind of cleaning and storage infrastructure that he has built on his farm. Um, <clears throat> so he's somebody that, you know, we wouldn't be here without. Um, and there's a lot of other farms that have been honestly because of Oshner Farms and how consistent and reliable they are and flexible to work with that has allowed us to then be able to work with other farms that are not as established with growing grains for malt and milling. But those farms are just as, um, you know, working just as hard, but they're kind of building their infrastructure um, from the ground up. Um, and so another farm that we've been working with for I think it's probably going on four or five years now, is Moral Farm. They're a dairy farm in New Hampshire. Um, and they are, um, you know, mostly focused on their cows, but they are growing grains now and have invested over the years in putting in silos to store the grain, um, have gotten really good at understanding how to grow the grain and when to harvest it and how to dry it down after harvest and store it. Um, and we've developed really great relationships with distilleries and breweries where every year the grain that they're asking us to 
source for them is coming from the same farm so that there's a multi-year connection between the distillery or the brewery and the dairy farm. Um, another farm that is kind of a great story is Tyler Murray. He's in New Hampshire, um, granite grains. <clears throat> He started about three or four years ago, really young kid. I, I want to say he's probably in his early 20, early to mid 20s, and he's kind of going at it all on his own. He didn't come from a farming family, but he wanted to be an organic farmer, um, was leasing most of his land in New Hampshire and put, took out a lot of loans through the Farm Service Agency to buy equipment to be able to grow Wabsie Valley corn and rye and wheat. Um, and now after three years, he's been working really hard, been really successful and was able to now buy his own 600 acre farm in Vermont. Um, so that's been a real success story um, in that, you know, you've got people that really are starting from scratch that are still able to make it make it happen. When a farmer like him starts, or would you recommend certain grains or crops that they should plant? To, to eventually work with you? I mean, when we're starting to work with farmers, usually now, now that we're doing distillery grains and we're hammer milling corn for distilleries, um, corn is definitely a good entry crop to work with because um, it's a corn that's, or it's a crop that's more familiar to growers. And um, so that is an area where we will start with a uh, farm is sourcing corn. And then if it seems like they're interested in kind of more uh, high, high, high value, high risk crops like malt barley or, or wheat for milling, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep working with them and kind of building that relationship a little bit more with other grains. Sometimes it just stays at corn. Um, Joe Sykowski here in Hadley. We've been sourcing corn from him now for almost 10 years. Um, we tried working with barley with him, but that was just a little too tricky given that uh, it was more of a cover crop, rotational crop for him. And he didn't really have the investment in some of the storage and infrastructure, but we've been able to source non-GMO and organic corn from him for years. And that continues to be a nice steady relationship. And um, Breathe Deep Farm in the Hudson Valley is a farm that's uh, a vegetable farm, but they've also started to acquire some land around them, trying to conserve land and grow grains. And uh, they're a regenerative organic farm. So um, we're the first mill and malt house to have regenerative organic malt and um, flour. And that's been, uh, that's kind of a new designation that Patagonia and Whole Foods and some other brands have kind of latched onto as a way, it's a little bit more than organic where you're, you're really trying to improve soil health along with making sure that you're using organic methods, like not using pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Synthetic fertilizers are, are a no a no, no. Um, and so that's been a great, you know, relationship that's developed over the last six years or so. Um, yeah, I mean, there's Porman farms in the Finger Lakes as well. Um, Jeff Trout, you know, we kind of, he, he grows our land race barley for us, our Hannah barley. Um, and he's, uh, you know, again, trying to conserve a family farm that's been in their family for generations. And although he has a day job, he's able to grow grains with his sons on the weekends and after work and stuff and make that work. And he grows, um, you know, a modest amount of grains and corn and soybeans for us and other maltsters in New York. Um, so, so for those labels, regenerative, organic, or, or the, the, the type of the grain or the name of the farmer, are those making it onto the end product, like the can of beer that's in front of us, or a, Here, a, a bag of bread? a beer right now called Right to Farm, a local malt lager series from Exhibit A. And if you turn the label from the beautiful front, the side here says, this pale lager was brewed with the following local malts, Girl Power Pills, Munich and Vava Vohm from Dancing Grain Farm in New York, Vienna from Thrall Farm in Connecticut. 
each case of beer supports 90 square feet of local farmland. Oh, that's amazing. So, well, exhibit, do think, it, exhibit A is doing it. They're, 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 they're able to sort of connect the dots for the consumer. I wouldn't say every single brewery that's buying craft mall is connecting those dots. And sometimes that just has to do with their own, you know, beliefs on how much information they're, you know, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there, we, and anybody gets an invoice from us or literally printed on every single bag is the variety of the grain, the day that it was malted, the lot number and the farm that it came from. And I still get comments all the time when we're working with new customers that they really appreciate that we list the name of the farm on our products. Um, because that's not something that every, um, craft maltster and certainly not large maltsters do. I mean, I, I know with certain things like some cheeses, I, I've, I, I know when the cows ate the grass, what time of year, and in that same cheese, you can taste the difference uh, from spring spring to fall. That was through our friend Ann Saxby. Kyle and I dro drove here from Boston. We were talking about cheese a lot. And um, it, it, I had a friend, a, a, a beef farmer, small-scale beef farmer, he wanted to... to he wanted everyone to do this huge transparency on their label, like what what the animals ate, you know, when and other things like that. So it's 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 a testament to, to the work that you're doing, because I want to know, too. And there's difference in flavors like I think this is the second right to farm beer I've had from you, Matt. Okay. Why don't we talk about this? Because I'm loving it. It's, it's daytime. I'm just travel, so my stomach's a little upset. And there's nothing better to soothe it than a nice locally made lager. Yeah. <laughs> If I could just interject about the, the listing the farm on the invoices, one of the things that happens in the brewery is that we'll get we'll get uh, we'll get it we'll get a shipment. Uh, we just got a handful of pallets, maybe four or six pallets, recently and yesterday. yesterday. And and like Frank, uh, our facilities manager, and Kyle, our production manager, will inevitably be like, "Oh, this came from this farm. We should look him up." And they'll go online and we'll look up the farm online just to kind of. If anything, it's like maybe a little bit romantic um, to kind of connect ourselves with the farmers. Um, we're already connected with the processors here at Valley Mall. We know them. They're our friends. They're our colleagues and obviously are one of our largest suppliers. Um, so to be able to, like you're saying, connect the dots from dirt to beer um, is just a really unique experience for us as, as beer makers. We don't have that opportunity generally. Um, when I get a you know, order from another maltster that might be a much larger maltster or European based uh, company. We don't not only do we not know what farm it comes from, but we don't we're not privy to that information. Um, in fact, I'm sure we could get it if we dug into it, um, but it's not something that is supplied to us. It's not even something I think that is valued um, in that world. So. Uh, it's it's actually a, a privilege to be able to know them. And then obviously each year we go on these tours with Valley Mall and we get to visit the farms and we get to know um, the farmers and their families and uh, and see what they're up to. I know that poor man, uh, you say that he has like this day job, but does his daughters also have like a sunflower business where they're growing like acres of sunflowers and they're starting this like Airbnb in silos and like we I'm learning all these things that, that are possible and really it's there is some certainly some romance to that but I think if anything it's just like real world stuff with family farms that are being creative in their way of developing their businesses. This is your third year coming on our field tours and so the first year you know you hear them saying oh look at that old you know my grandfather's old house uh, we're going to turn that into an event space. And then the next year you go and you see it's it's getting there. And then, you know, you maybe this year we'll go and who knows, you know, and or you'll go and they'll be like, hey, we're thinking, you know, you know, things are going well. We're going to put a silo there next year. Yeah. And then you go back next year and there's a silo. Yeah. And it's like, this is the future. The future is local. There's no doubt in my mind that the future is not going to be local. Um, and there's, you know, we're seeing it happening, unfolding 
year to year when we go visit these farms. And higher quality and, and not mass produced. Kyle, on the way over, we were also talking about, you know, you, you source a lot of foods and you were talking about why are people buying things, the same product from Italy or somewhere else when you say it's here and it's better and it's local? Yeah, um, I guess I was saying... Um, I have a father-in-law that tells me how great Italy is, how great the food is, and how, how everyone there is just over the moon for the tomatoes and the artichokes and this and that. And uh, every year, I have great tomatoes in Massachusetts, and I have great artichokes in Massachusetts, and great asparagus. And uh, just, uh, I have a lot of epiphanies, I think, maybe one every week, but this one this week was just, geez, why do we need to go to Italy? We just eat what's in season here. Um, and it's just like a super simple uh, concept. No, it's great. And I was just thinking about the beer in front of me. So going back to since I first met Andrea and, and I've learned about craft malts, and as there's more brewers working with craft malts, especially in New York, Plan B always stood out. Our friends in the Hudson Valley, from day one, they're 100% New York ingredients, which includes a, a regional or a local malt. And uh, a couple years ago, I was in this part of Massachusetts in Greenfield at one of the Saturdays event, and I made it to People's Pint, where I'd never been. And I wasn't sure what to order, but they they mentioned uh, that they had local malt beer. They might have mentioned your, your your malt facility, but we love the beers. And there's so many times, time and time again now, when, when I'm at Matt and I'm drinking Exhibit A, when I'm drinking a beer in that region and it's made from local malt, it, it, it's the beer I want to drink. And um, I don't know how you explain that to someone you know, to your, to your staff. I would feel like before you talk to customers, you got to talk, tell your staff about that. How, how have you trained and, and, and made your team aware of, of just how different your beer is? So, I mean, the first step of that is obviously training them on our own kind of ethos about that and why we use local grain, why we produce beer the way we do. And then really dig right into like, why are we here? Um, we used to take a trip every year, sometimes twice a year, to come visit the mall house. So we have great memories of bringing different iterations of our staff over the last eight years to visit Andrea and Christian and get a tour of the facility. Um, they've always been super gracious and you know made us lunch, not all that dissimilar from the lunch we just enjoyed together uh, with local breads and local whatever, lettuce and the, and the things. Um, I do want to quickly mention, though, that on my way here, which was about a 14-mile drive, there were nine places to buy fresh asparagus where you put the money in the box and you just take what you want. And that, to me, is like very telling about, yeah, I agree. Italy's great. It's fine. There's no reason to go to Italy for produce, though. There's so much great local in-season produce that's happening starting now until you know, basically the end of September, October, where we can choose to eat the things that are coming out of the ground tomorrow, this week, right? And so I think that there's a, this kind of mis misstep, I think, in the way we eat just in general. And there's something really redeeming about our region. We can get all of these ingredients that we want. Obviously, we're not growing coffee or other things here that just don't grow here, but that's okay. We can source them. But I think it's really exciting to drive by nine farms that are selling asparagus out of a box. Um, and, uh, and obviously the it's the best. Asparagus. It's like literally the best asparagus. Yeah, I was eating it raw on my way over. So. Is this the Pioneer Valley? Exactly. We don't like to call it the Pioneer Valley anymore because that's kind of like a colonial term. Um, but it is the Connecticut River Valley. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the same. Th I was I, I was confused. I never quite knew what Pioneer Valley meant. Pioneer is just, you know, like celebrating colonialism. But it's the Connecticut River it's the Valley. Connecticut River, at least that's what we like to call it. So yeah. this, this is super fertile. Apples, vegetables. Um, you know, back with you guys, too, this idea of, of having to work with the farms and 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 getting them to the next step just to just to make this malt that that w when were people last really making malt in in this part of the country um probably my grandfather's generation so that would have been like the early 1900s late 1800s but even then it was on the decline because of the erie canal and 
you know, just the Great Lakes and transportation and rail making things easier to import. Um, and obviously there's more land in the West, so more land to be able to grow crops like grains, um, which economically are, you know, lower value than growing asparagus. <laughs> How much, you know, the, the amazing asparagus is six fifty a bunch now, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, you can make a farmer in Hadley and prime river bottom soil, some of the best soil in the world can make twenty, thirty thousand dollars on an acre of asparagus. Granted, it's high value, high labor, high input. Whereas a cover crop like grains is probably only going to make a farm a couple thousand at the most. And that's if they're selling it to somebody like us that's paying a lot for it and values it. If it's being sold on the commodity market, it's even it's hundreds of dollars. So but that land needs cover crops like grains in order for the soil to rest and replenish and add organic matter to the soil. So um, it's a necessary thing. But yeah, I would say, I, you know, I would say that probably the, the malting and the growing of malting grade grains in the Northeast, I mean, Maine, Maine never really stopped because they have their potato um, economy and barley was a typical rotation for um, uh with potatoes. So Maine has been growing barley, malt barley for a while, and then generally shipping it up to um, Canada, have them malted. Well, that's there's, pretty great. It's a rich history, you know, and there's reasons. I mean, the whole idea of like romanticizing Italy and stuff. I mean, I think the reason why people romanticize it is because when you go there, you realize that that culture values it. Right. Um, whereas Sorry. in America, we have valued McDonald's. Yeah. and fast food and yeah. you know convenience, convenience. Um, and that's just it's a cultural thing um, but you know I think that once we start realizing those choices lead to poor health outcomes and you know economic uh, you know especially in rural areas uh, decimation of an economy um, then you know you start realizing maybe we want to change our culture a little bit and maybe we want to value things like delicious tomatoes and the people who grew it a little bit more well, let's try the next beer too um if you want to pour that out and tell us about it this is the cat's meow which is our i guess for lack of a better term our flagship it's i like to say it's the one that put the kid through art school um it's rough well that that means you actually are doing very well with it well, i mean yeah art school's expensive um <laughs> This is about 45, 50% of our production at Exhibit A. Cheers. This is a 6.5% um, IPA, uh, New England style IPA, with a really intentionally malt focused structure. Um, we use a combination of Golden Valley Pale, which is kind of a I would say a British inspired grain, if you will. Um, uh, some Vava Vome, which is the dextrin malt that, that Andrew and Christian developed for our needs. Uh, also, there's um, a bunch of warthog wheat in there from Oshner Farm. And, you know, we, we, we hop the hell out of it. I'm not gonna pretend this is a malt forward beer, um, but it's, it's something we take a lot of pride in as far as the way we build our beers, which is through malt. We don't build them with hops, we build them with malt and then we, spice them and add aroma with these hops, right? And uh, so it's an exciting beer for us. It's the one that kind of keeps our yeast happy. It keeps our, uh, uh, you know, our, our regulars happy. And uh, it's a big part of our business. Um, what do you mean it keeps your yeast happy? Well, we brew it almost every week. Um, so every time we brew it, we're pitching fresh or we're, we're harvesting fresh generational yeast out of that beer to make the next batch of beer. So it's a, it's a you know, there's there's breweries that really we, we don't just make beer. We grow yeast. Right. And so a beer like this is, is a great beer for growing yeast. It's you know, under 7% alcohol. It is well hopped, but the way that we harvest, we harvest prior to, to dry hopping. So there's actually not a lot of hops in the product during fermentation. And we don't do uh, any any uh, cold side additions until after the, har the harvest, um, which keeps the yeast happy. And, uh, and it, it delivers a really viable and healthy 
um, wonderfully smelling yeast that uh, goes into the next batch of beer, whether it's another batch of cat or some porter or other beers that we make. Um, the thing I really love about this beer is that it allows us to, um, like in just terms of like logistics and procurement, we know how much of this beer we're making. It's a lot. And it's, if it's half of our business, we need to always have the grains in house ready to go for this beer. And we, sh you know, like a lot of breweries, we share ingredients throughout our portfolio. So there's GVP golden Valley pale in a bunch of our beers. Um, some of them are built similarly. Like we have a double IPA called hair razor. The ingredient list is very similar percentages are different um a little bit more two row uh from another supplier that goes into that beer um just to kind of boost the alcohol um and then there's a different hopping regimen but uh yeah i think um you know it's 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 great to have a, a flagship that one that we're super proud of that is you know typical uh, you know, IPA beer in a portfolio is going to likely be the leader um, at a brewery in Massachusetts right now. Um, I don't know very many breweries that have something that isn't uh, an IPA as a leader around us. Um, there's a few that there are a few breweries that maybe focus on lagers or Belgian influenced beers and, and don't have IPA as their flagship, but it's a rarity. Um, so, you know, we're not, we're not um, unique in that, but I think, as far as New England IPAs go, this is definitely um, not just a juice forward beer. This is a well developed, well, you know, very dynamic, slightly even bitter IPA. Wow. Well, we enjoy our Cast Me Off from Exhibit A. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni. It's our 15th year. Support us. Become a member at heritageradionetwork.org. So we're drinking Exhibit A, Cast Me Out with Matt Steinberg. And uh, we've got our friend Kyle from Brewers Food and Andrea Stanley from Valley Mall. So, Andrea, we're in your brand new spanking mall, mall house and, and, and mill. Is this also called a mill? Yep mill we we grind we grind flour here and make malt and uh yeah we're we call it our our mill so in terms of the operations are you bringing in the same grains for flour that you're doing for beer how is that overlap and some differences in the you know processes most of the grains are the same that's part of the beauty of how we developed our product line um, because we wanted to keep buying more grains from the farms that we were working with. Um, the only, the only difference is on the mill side, on the ground up side, we source some hard red spring wheat. And that's something that we don't use on the malting side because that tends to have higher protein, which is not something that necessarily a brewer wants in their wheat malt. Um, they want more starches than protein. Um, but on the flour side, you do need protein in order to have enough um, gluten structure on bread, in for bread flours and things like that. So we do bring in um, some hard red spring wheat. That's really the only grain that doesn't um, play with both the malt and the mill. I, I've been since, since uh, the pandemic when you guys started doing ground up grain. I, I usually have some some of your flour in my house. I don't, I don't bake too often, but I make a lot of pancakes. And the, your all purpose sometimes I mix the all purpose flour with the Danko rye flour. And um, but what, so what's typically in that that all purpose flour? That is warthog wheat grown by Oshner Farms and Harris, which is an heirloom soft white wheat. So both both what you call winter grains. So they're planted in the fall. They serve as a cover crop and they get harvested beginning of July. Um, and yeah, both of those are low protein, great flavor, and uh, those go into our all-purpose flour. You know, I noticed just how busy you are uh, when we're here. People keep asking you questions and showing you monitors. What, you just stepped out for something. What, 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 
give us a, a little rundown of, of this day in your life in, in, in the mill and malt facility? Well, one or two examples of something you get caught yeah, up with. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a lot of fun. I mean, we have an awesome team. Generally, our discussions are just check-ins and verifying that we're all on the same page. Um, you know, I, I kind of serve as the operations manager here. I also do sales. Um, and human resources <laughs> and, you know, do the, you know, just like the small business thing. Christian does the finances and all the engineering. He's got a, a boom truck coming here, an emergency boom truck. Cause we just found out one of our grain silo, uh, valves is clogged. So we've got a guy that's bringing, uh, Dave Cotton, our, our hero is bringing a boom truck over so we can fix that. So we can unload some soft white wheat from the silos, uh, for the mill to, to grind next week. Um, but you know, I mean, it's nice being here and having staff and being a more established business, uh, days don't feel chaotic generally. Um, they feel like things are running and we can trust people to do their jobs and do them well. And I would say, you know, it's, uh, it's a really, fun job to have. I still love it. Well, you as a maltstress, um, I've already seen so many pictures of you in, in, in malting and working, working with that grain. Are you still doing malting yourself? I do the quality. So like earlier today, when you saw you came, I was checking some friability and doing some quality checks. Um, but no, at this point, I don't really do a whole lot of production. Um, I'm doing more of the management stuff and I am doing production now of our pasta cause we were doing fresh pasta now with our stone milled flowers. So until we can generate enough income from that to hire somebody, I'm, I'm the pasta maker, but, um, but generally, no, I'm not, I'm not really bagging all that much malt anymore or shoveling any of it or really doing any of that. Oh, it's super cool. And then you mentioned friability. What is it? Um, friability is a way to check how well we've uh, modified the malt. So it goes in this little hamster wheel that you, has a, a mallet that's pressing the grain and it runs for eight minutes. And generally, if the malt is well modified, it crushes it all into um, like little pieces. And then anything that's retained inside the screen um, is considered unmodified or not friable. So it's, it's a percentage thing where we're, um, just checking the outcome of our, of our malt. I know we've done some other shows on craft malt and, and with you and some folks at the craft malt conference last year. So go back and listen to those. Cause there's a, there's a lot of, of technology and science and knowledge that you guys have learned in, in the last 10 years. You want to give a shout out to, to anybody in the industry that, that, that you've worked closely with. Well, on the quality side, I will say that, you know, the Hartwick Center for Craft Food and Beverage was instrumental in letting all of us craft maltsters have access to analytics. So they do all of our grain analysis to let us know that the grain is safe and of quality to use. Um, but also they do our malt analysis as well. And uh, Aaron McLeod started that program back in 2014. Uh, and Harmony Bettenhausen, doc Dr. Harmony Bettenhausen, um, has been running it for the last several years. Um, and uh, I love to always give shout out to them because we don't do any of this in a bubble. Um, I'm just like one person doing one piece of something. Um, but people like Harmony and Aaron McLeod and the technicians that they work with and train at Hartwick are instrumental in allowing us to have access to really high quality testing, which is really important. Um, without it, we wouldn't know if we were making good malt. So Kyle, as, as, a, as a chef, you know, you used to work at Blue, Blue Hill in Manhattan and you're making pita chips now if i said friability to you as a chef what would you say back yeah uh yeah how quickly something fries yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks for clearing that up yeah. on the way over he was talking about different places and how they cook their pita chips and didn't you say one you just cook it in a pot uh yeah some well some of these larger food manufacturers have figured out how to make things very quickly and very uh cheaply um and yes yeah, some people just buy the pitas and fry them 
super quick, super easy. And some people um, sheet them like a, like a sheet of pasta dough and then they cut them out and make them look like pita chips. And then some people do it the old fashioned way um, like we do and we make a pita and we cut the pita then we bake the pita. So, you know, lots of people do things different ways to get the result they want. Well, on, on this food chain, one reason we're with you, we're just going to say a few words about it because we had a nice show a couple months ago with you and Tyler from uh, Lamplighter. You're the spent grain guy. You know, that's how I met you. Also in the pandemic, I met you. Um, you've got a line of, of crackers, cookies, and... Uh, Delicious crackers, by the way. These pretzel crackers are... I You have to take them away from me. Yeah. Brewers, crackers, brewers, food. But, um, you know, how does spent grain fit in this? Because you're getting this wonderful local crop. It's getting malted. It's made into beer. And we kind of know about spent grain. But what does it mean to you? To, to Is there a difference for you to get spent grain from a, 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 a local you know, grain and malt versus something else. I mean, uh, how, how do you, how do you work with it? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the difference between drinking, you know, um, a typical, you know, mass market beer versus drinking one of Matthew's beers. It's night and day. Um, so just imagine that difference, but put it into your food. So what I, what I really want to do is, it's kind of two things. I want to fight food waste, right? I want to, um, make sure that the farmer that spent time, money, energy, uh, tears, whatever they had to spend on making that grain, that malt, um, making sure that people get the most value out of it that they can. Um, so that's important, fighting food waste. Um, and then also, you just, the more you hang out in New England and the more you meet people like Andrea and Matthew, you, you see how much work and energy and thought um, they put into the malt and the grain and who grew it, where it came from, uh, how it got there. Um, and you just can't ignore people throwing it away without giving it a second thought. Um, so I'm just giving it a second thought and then I'm giving it uh, a place to go. Um, and for me, that's crackers, chips, and cookies. Um, super normal things. You're not gonna like hurt your brain thinking about it. Um, but yeah, just kind of getting that product um, and just treating it with the respect that many, many other people treated it with. Um, so I'm just kind of finishing, I think I'm finishing the circle. What's the secret, you as a chef, the pretzel recipe for the pretzel crackers? Oh, pretzels. I mean, I asked me to tell a secret. Um, geez, the secret is just don't oversalt the pretzel. Don't oversalt it. Uh, if it's a good, it's a good pretzel, it's going to taste good, whether it has a ton of salt on it or all the salt falls off. Um, we, I like to put sesame seeds on ours. It's a, actually a sesame pretzel flatbread. Um, we do unhulled sesame seeds. Um, they have the hulls. So that's where the oil is. That's where the good stuff is. Um, so it packs a bunch of like peanut buttery flavors, and and yeah, don't oversalt it because you're going to eat it with cheese or some dip. So. Too much salt to ruin it. Well, um, you're a staple in my house. When I'm here, I, I want to. The last thing we're probably talking about is, is this the grains challenge where, you know, the food pyramids in, in, in tradition, whole grains are, are such a staple of our modern civilization, of, of, of our diet. I, I get whole grains from uh, someone in the Hudson Valley, Wild Hive. And he packs and ships whole grain. And that's my, that's my multigrain cereal. And I supplement it with spelt from either ground up grain or spelt from him and whole spelt berries. And I feel like a king. I can use, I can have that at every meal. My, my grandfather from Italy, he was either always having, you know, really hearty corn polenta or some type of grana grain that was basically like spelt and farro and these type of things. And to me, that, that's an important part of, of, your, of your, your diet. Except when I go out, when I go to the store, I can't get those grains in, that, that, that I want to eat. And what, what, what's, what's wrong? Explain to me why grains are important to us, but most grains, when I want to buy a grain, it's not good for me. Well, because we live in a food system that has skewed more toward ultra processing. So when you're taking a whole grain and you're wanting it to have a shelf life of 25 years <laughs> or whatever, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's extreme, but 
what I'm saying is that things are set up to be cheap and to be um, shelf stable and whole grains because there's a germ, which is the embryo that would have grow the, you know, help to grow a, a new plant that has oils and lipids and things in it that are going to determine the shelf life somewhat. And then even in the bran and other aspects of the grain that are the parts that are really nutritional, they have B vitamins, they have potassium, they have iron. Um, those things tend to get processed out. Um, and a lot of flour and a lot of our carbs are being re-enriched with um, vitamins and nutrients because they have to be. The FDA requires that. But all of that is in the whole grain. So if you look for whole grain products, generally you're going to be eating something that is good for you because it has dietary fiber, it has nutrients, it has a good balance of protein and carbohydrates, um, and it's going to be good for your digestion. When you're eating things that are ultra processed, you know, think of Wonder Bread, um, that color, that lack of flavor, that spongy consistency, that's all through processing that that happens. Um, and that also is, you know, kind of um, probably what you're talking about, you know, where it's hard to find those whole grain products out there. I would also add, um, I didn't sell crackers or make crackers in my life before this, but I have learned a lot in the last eight years. And what I have learned is that selling food in the supermarket is a business first. And just because a supermarket has customers that want something doesn't mean they're going to sell it. Um, every inch of the store is typically a money-making uh, position. So if I told Andrea a term before, I said velocity, and she's like, oh, what's that mean? I said, velocity is how fast something sells. And if it's like whole grains, flour, ground up grain flour, if, if the velocity isn't there, so if they can't sell it fast enough, it's probably not gonna be on the shelf. Whether it's gonna solve everyone's issues or not, um, that's just like a fact of the kind of the majority of supermarkets people shop at. And that's not all supermarkets and not all co-ops and all stores. There are always places to find things, but the stores feeding most of our population are gonna work off of every inch of that store is a dollar amount. So that's part of the reason why you can't find all these really nice, um, better for you grains in the stores. Probably makes us wanna shop in smaller, locally owned like co-ops and markets that support that supply chain. Um, I have learned more about barley seed and wheat seed from Andrea and Tor and Christian too, but mostly Andrea for over the last 10 years than I ever thought was possible. I remember like learning that there was this local mall house opening like in 2010 and, and meeting these folks and, and becoming great friends over the years. Um, there's been such a massive learning curve for me that every time we get together, I learn, I feel like I learned something new about grain. I knew that friability had nothing to do with, you know, frying, but that's only because she told me this like nine years ago or whatever, and it stayed, it stuck. And I think one of the most exciting parts about this friability sounds sexy too. <laughs> pretty good, but it's, it's important. I mean, we want high percentage of friability for efficiency and, and just better, better, you know, usage inside the mall, inside the mash gun. But, um, I the resources are out there. We can learn these things on our own by going on the internet, but there's something very cool about the collaborative kind of conversations that can be had um, with a small company. So like you were saying, like you're going to say like the River Valley Co-op to sell your products, you can talk to someone who's going to have a direct effect on where your where your product is placed in the store, what their customers are looking for. You can even develop like, well, hey, the sesame seed's cool. We kind of want less sesame seed. All right, well, I'll make a batch for you with a little less sesame seed. Maybe you're not doing that, but you have that ability as a small producer. Um, we get that a lot in the beer world where they're like, can you make me this beer? We, we, I'm this bar and whatever. I have this thing. And there's some flexibility there that like a commodity brand or a large producer can't even that really has no interest in. And I think, you know, we sell beer to large stores that have many stores across the country, like a total wine and a Wegmans and that kind of place. 
Costco. We also sell most of our beer in small independent retailers. The small independent retailers are what drive these brands. It is. Um, yes, people go to Total and they spend a bunch of money and buy products, but is that customer actually looking for the whole grain at Whole Foods that's healthier for them, or are they just going to stop and shop and buying whatever flour? Um, I think it's it's there's a difference in the consumer, and I think we're coming around. And then but just back to the moment I was convinced that local grain farm malted could taste better in beers was in 2016 when I first visited the only time I visited Dwar Eschner out in in the Finger Lakes at his farm and after we sat and talked he took out a case of Exhibit A Dank or Rye <laughs> so I was convinced that moment and, and, and right away that was my, my favorite beer of the year and I did finally a couple years ago get to visit you Matt at Exhibit A in, in Framingham and I did walk with some some of the Danko but there's another one too so we went through everything we went through your right to farm there was it was a local malt lager and then we had your Cat's Meow your flagship IPA but now we have a, a dark beer I like the yeah. progression Briefcase Porter um, I believe that every brewery should have a year-round porter that uh, represents who they are as a brewery. I think that, um, you know, we started out, when we first brewed this beer, it was called Demo Tape 5, and that was our first couple weeks of being open, and I used uh, a specialty uh, dark malts from England, from Simpsons Malting, great company, um, great family, um, and I looked at the package of the chocolate malt, and I was like, oh, this is a year old. It was fine. It looked right. It added color to the beer, but it lacked aroma and character that I thought I would that it would deliver. Um, we immediately asked Andrea if they would make us um, some dark malt, some roasted grains, uh, and they did. And and we developed over time what those grains would now become: um, brown malt, uh, roasted oats, roasted uh, chocolate wheat. We have a chocolate rye that they make for us. And this beer, they would get roasted and literally delivered to your house the same yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. I, showed up, I showed up at home one time. I showed up to the house, and Andrea was chatting with my family after dropping off bags of grain. And I come in, and there's like a bag of chocolate wheat on the living room floor. And I'm like, there's something, you know, I, I don't see the environment doing that. And you know, and you know, no, no, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the reality is, is we have that freedom. We have a local producer that is small, flexible, um, and listens to their customers. And so we develop grains specifically for these dark beers that we're making, whether it's Briefcase Porter, Sunday Paper Stout, um, and other dark beers, like we do a dark lager in the series of Right to Farm. And there's something really just amazing about having access to not only the, the finished product, but the process of getting it there. Like we talk about the color we want, the, the, the roasted character that we want, the level of temperature and time inside the roasting uh, machine. And so that's something that is, is very redeeming as, as a, you know, as a, as a user of these grains. I love Porter. I feel like every time I come across a brewery that doesn't have like a dark beer in their portfolio, or at least a dark beer that isn't riddled with sweet things, I'm like, where's your Amber Ale? Where's your Porter? I don't even make an Amber, but I do think it's an important part of a portfolio having a Porter. It's just one of those things. I can't imagine. I don't think I've ever worked in a brewery that didn't have one, but I think that's probably because I made it happen. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, this can says just another delicious porter by Matthew Steinberg. <laughs> yeah. And years ago, when I remember at my old pub, we we were starting to have four or five really good IPAs on draft. I had customers saying, I want something malty, malt forward. And none of us really knew what they were talking about, but this this porter would have fit. And then the last thing, not last thing, because I want you guys to each ask Andrea a question because just she's a wealth of knowledge and uh, yeah. I will never... So, Kyle's, Kyle's, first. <laughs> Kyle's first. And it might be about spent grain yeah. processing. Yes. Um, I, I think I want to make a, a GMO organic corn cracker. Because it sounds like that's going to be the easiest grain for me to convince a farmer to grow. Is that right? Uh, or as a crop to to get them to get them into growing 
graves, right? It could be, but I think, you know, when I was talking about the corn earlier, and that's going for the distillery market, and the milling market is a little bit different. Like some of the, I think that would be a little bit more complicated. Um, and then also just the assumption that if it's corn, it's going to be gluten free. And certainly anything that's coming through our facility is not going to be gluten free because of all the grains that we process. Um, but I will say that that could be a really great R and D project where you could play around with some of the different heirloom corns and, you know, and, and come up with one that really makes a great cracker. Yeah. And corn's really cool. I, I know I've met some farmers in southern New Hampshire, like Tuckaway Farm, and, and they're growing a couple heirloom. Did you hear about Tuckaway Farm? I, tell us. Tuckaway Farm had a devastating fire about a month ago, six weeks ago. Um, Sarah and Duncan Cox are the sort of current generation that's been farming, but um, they're doing okay. But uh, yeah, that's um, there's been a lot of farm barn fires on farms recently, and and I think a big part of that is that that does happen occasionally. But also, I think some of the climate change and just some of these droughts and dryness is really drying down some of these old barns and things like that and making them, uh, making these things more common, but. Well, I'll um, give them a shout out because I do get from my, great stuff. my home use, I, I get cornmeal and also polenta when sometimes they have this red Italian corn. And so corn's been on, on my mind, oh, mind yeah. as well. Fact, Tyler Murray, who we were talking about earlier, he, Sarah Cox introduced me to Tyler because she was milling his Wapsi Valley corn, his organic corn for the cornmeal that they make at Tuckaway. And then just shout out to, to Sarah Cox and Tuckaway Farm. This summer, I know you're having a bar, a barbecue event, barbecue or something. Um, I'm going to be there. So nice. whatever day it is, be there too. end of June or in July, too. it's at Tuckaway we'll, Farm. We'll be Lena there together. Yeah. And it's fun to say, oh, yeah, I know there's a small farm in Lee, New Hampshire that grows all these heirloom corns or process it. And that that's you guys. That's yeah, Tuckaway I don't know if their GoFundMe is still going, but it's Tuckaway Farm and they're amazing people, amazing farm, and they are part of our green community. She's amazing. She only took a, with that fire, she only took seemed like a, a week off. And next thing you know, she was Boom. talking about what's, what's growing and, yep. and all that. Yeah. Matt, you got a question for our, Andrea? <laughs> I mean, we talk like every three days. So I, I'm trying to think of a question that I haven't asked recently. How about a, a typical question? Because you, we're not there all the time. So, um, I'm really excited about the pasta business that, that, that Valley Mall and Ground Up Grain has started to create. I'm curious what uh, what you what you're envisioning for the next steps in that business and, and how that's going to uh, find its success within your portfolio. Oh, gosh. Um, I am just excited about all of the customers that we currently work with. So my idea with the pasta is that we're going to use our current channels. I'm trying to circumvent regular distribution channels because the value of what we do, it's hard to make its way to, you know, the bigger retail places. And so we're marketing a lot of our fresh pasta just to the bakeries and the restaurants and the places that currently buy our flour. And then just having the pasta be another thing that they can sell that supports, you know, local grains and highlights local grains. So what I'm really excited about is we're, we're launching our first product, which is an ancient grain bucatini, which is 50% durum flour, 25% barley flour, and 25% soft white wheat that Oshner Farms grows. And um, when you say ancient grain, anything is sexy. It's exciting. Super exciting. Barley is one of the ancientest of the grains and barley has amazing nutritional properties, high dietary fiber, um, and really, uh, a lot of nutrients. So our, our pasta, if you look at the nutritional facts of our pasta versus nutritional facts of a pasta that you get off the shelf, you'd see that there's little to no nutrition, pretty much just 
carbs in regular pasta. And our pasta actually has a lot of dietary fiber and 23% of the dietary fiber that you need for a day is in a serving of our pasta. Um, and one thing about grain, let's now we're talking about nutrition because I, when you when you read about maybe Michael Pollan or someone else, grain is grass. It's really it's a plant based thing. It's it's a vegetable, mm -hmm. so there's got to be good things in it. But why do some people think of it as starch or just a carb when it's because a vegetable? Because it's been ultra processed. So when it's ultra processed, all they're trying to get out of it is the starch. But there's actually so much more in that what that grass grew <laughs> that has the things that you actually need to digest it. Yeah, so the grain is grass. My grandfather, okay. The, the, prob the, the problem with our food system is we're not eating whole grains. We're eating ultra-processed grains. So the armies of ancient Rome, they marched on some kind of grain. It might have been called farro. What grains do you think they were marching on? I don't know. <laughs> ancient grains. I don't know. But ancient, yeah. They were definitely ancient. Yeah. So, um, but just yeah. to say, I'm really, what, what I'm excited about is sort of the way that the public is going to be introduced to our pasta. They're going to be introduced through Forge Bakery in Somerville that already they buy delicious products from or Gray Barn in, on Martha's Vineyard. And they're going to be introduced and it's going to be fresh and it's going to be like, yep, I've been to the place. I know the lady that makes this pasta and mills the flour. Um, and so the other exciting thing about the pasta is that we're for the first time trying to grow Durham wheat in the Northeast. So fingers crossed, we're going to have 25 acres of Durham wheat this year growing in the Northeast. Um, well, why is that hard? Wait, wait, okay. why, why is that so hard? Well, Durham is typically um, grown in more dry land conditions, but I think that with the grower, we have Spencer Thrall, who owns Thrall Family Malt in Connecticut. He's the one who is growing it for us. Um, he's a great grower. He, I think if anybody can do it, he could do it. Obviously, Tor Oshner could too, but... Um, yeah, so uh, I'm excited about the way that it's going to hopefully people are going to be introduced to it. And then honestly, I don't even know where it would go from there, but I'm excited about starting with the ancient grain bucatini. And then pasta is such a great vehicle for people to actually taste grain flavor. Um, so I'm excited about once people get introduced to our pasta and they trust us and they like it, then we can start saying, okay, here's, uh, an heirloom or here's a, uh, land race French red wheat called Rouge de Bordeaux. Here's what our bucatini tastes like with that. Um, and then people will just start like, okay, a Danko rye gnocchi. Okay, what does Danko rye taste like? Well, if you really want to taste it, try this pasta with a little bit of olive oil and a tiny bit of herb and Parmesan cheese, and that is what Danko rye tastes like. So, you know, that's. Or try my pancakes about. with Danko rye flour. Well, why didn't you bring them, Jimmy? <laughs> I, just give me a skillet. <laughs> her 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 pancakes. <laughs> and her pancake queen. I think I ripped off her recipe. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, she always told me, we talk about using grains in that level, because I'm, I'm just like. Pancakes I, is a she said, way to substitute grain the grain. If, yeah. you, if you're just using yeah. supermarket flour. Yeah. If you ever really want to learn what does spelt taste like, make pancakes from spelt because you don't need the gluten to make pancakes. Same thing with pasta, especially when you're extruding it. You don't need some of the functionality that you might need from another type of wheat to have the gluten structure. So you can really enjoy the flavor of a particular grain, like 100% barley pasta. You really taste what barley tastes like so i'm making this fresh pasta at home for my son who's 14 who's developing a better palate i mean he used to just be chicken nuggets meat and basically fruit was his whole diet um he's now venturing into all foods and loves uh trying new things um I'm going to be making him more pasta tonight. Um, and instead of saucing it and garlicking it and all of that stuff, we're just literally going to do some, uh, some steamed broccoli on the side with olive oil and salt and pepper just to taste the pasta because I have two varieties that I want him to taste. And I think there's something about where we're, we're, we're not training our palates well at a young age because we're giving them macaroni and cheese 
out of a box rather than a fresh macaroni with some, you know, farm raised butter and this cheese that Kyle brought. Like there's, there's a way to do, to, like you're saying, actually taste the ingredients that are used to make the product. And I'm really excited to do that for my family. Um, because I feel like there's a bit of a disservice on, on enjoyment of food. Like let's enjoy it more because we're able to get these ingredients and get these, these tools to do that. Um, I, I did have a follow up question about pasta is that we talked about a long time ago, you spoke about like these kind of like, uh, you know, malt of the month club was a thing where you'd have, have like home brewers would get this like box every month of different malts to make a batch of beer with. Is there something like that that is being discussed about your pasta and other products that you sell? Discussed within my own brain yes. to myself. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I haven't really thought about like the idea of pasta of the month. I know we were talking about doing pasta classes where people could come taste the barley pasta, taste the rye pasta, taste the spelt pasta, and then create their own blends to then take home with them. Um, and that's something that we've already done with some of our customers, like Clear Flower. Um, their whole team came here one day and we just played with all different kinds of blends of pasta of flowers to make the pasta. Um, and like, what shape do you like for what grain, you know, um, yeah, we texture is a big did. part of it. Yeah. yeah. Paul, when Paul came here, that was fun. Paul from Zero gravity, um, an American flatbread he was in town. He's, he and Destiny was were, stayed at my house that night, and in the morning we came here and made pasta for a couple of hours. We had so much pasta. We left here with like just cases of pasta and all different types. Like yeah. you know, there was a certain percentage of barley and a certain percentage of spelt, and we had many varieties. Einkorn, I think we were doing the like einkorn, einkorn pasta. Yeah, yeah, there was so many cool varieties that we tried, um, and it was that part's really fun. Like you're talking about just tasting the ingredients, yeah. you know. Yeah. The pasta of the month thing is a great idea. I want. Let's do it. I want that. Yeah. I want pasta every month. You know what's great about Peter? I walked in. The first thing Andrew showed us was the pasta making area. Yeah. It's just getting started. Kyle, we're going to wrap this up. Kyle, one reason we've been on, we've talked to you a couple of times this year. You talked about the next big step in this whole circle of grain is spent grain drying, the processing of spent grain, and and. Just, just tell everyone again what, what you're thinking about. I know it's a long-term project. Yeah, I have, um, I'm a dreamer. I have a dream. Um, the dream would be to take the grain that the farmers grow, Andrea Maltz, Matthew brews with, then get it to me. I'd love to dry it. I'd love to process it into food that people eat on a daily basis, uh, bread, pasta, crackers, chips, cookies, um, in a, a singular, a singular facility, um, not unlike what Andrew does, but that's like way on the other side of town. Um, I'd like to be on the other side of town. And if I could figure out how to do that, I think that's a huge win for just the, the food, the food system that maybe hasn't been seen ever. No one's ever, not never, but like it's rare to see an industry take something from, um, growing, to using completely and then not throwing it away. That happens all the time, yeah. but not maybe necessarily in the food industry and maybe not always for better for you. Um, you can make anything into food, but we want to make it into better for you food. So when, when I make a batch of beer, well, I don't make beer, <laughs> Matt makes it. Tell us what, what what's the spent grain when it comes out? Well, like Andrea, I don't really have my hands in the production daily anymore, which is both exciting and oddly just really redeeming. I love that I don't have to mash in at five in the morning anymore, but, um, our, the way our brew house works is we run off, we use as little water uh, as possible. And I will give some credit to Kyle Warren and, and, uh, John Meyer in our brew house now that, that have been really instrumental in reducing our water usage in our beer production. Basically when we're done running off into the kettle, there's essentially not much water left to come out of the grain. All the water that is in the grain is gonna stay there without a dryer. If we had a drying facility, which Kyle and I have spoken about on, on several occasions now, we could remove that water, 
use that grain in some other fashion, whether it's upcycled into food products for his company or other other like-minded type of things. Um, right now, what we do is there's a farm called Hidden Acre Farms. They're in Medway. Uh, Dave and his family run that farm, and they have um, pigs and, and uh, dairy cattle um, and chickens and all sorts of other things happening at their farm. And they do feed our spent grain to those animals. Um, it isn't a perfect solution. Um, it is a solution. Um, I prefer to send it to a farm like him that uh, is, he's, he's a very responsible guy. I think he cares deeply about his land. There's very few farms left in his area. I actually grew up in that area. And when I lived in Medway, and we moved there in 1979. The whole town was farms. And now there's one farm. You know, all the rest of the farms have become uh, McMansion developments. Um, so he's still there and he's doing his thing. Uh, we pay him monthly to pick up our grain. He picks up every day that we brew. Um, it's heavy. It's arduous and terrible to kind of remove it because it's in these big buckets and he's got to roll it onto his truck. Um, but there's really no other great solution for, for getting rid of this besides, you know, be, uh, cattle or pigs, um, other than drying it and using it in upcycled food products, which again would be a wonderful solution, but we're just waiting for the, well, I shouldn't say we're waiting. We need to get our stuff together so we can build that infrastructure and, and have that be a real viable solution for us. Um, there's something really interesting about throwing away 2,000 pounds of grain, and I say throw it away. I mean, we're sending we're sending it to feed for feed, but it leaves the brewery kind of like, and it's gone out of our minds. But it isn't gone. It's being, it has its reason for existing and going to these places. Um, there's a lot of breweries and and much fewer farms than there used to be. Um, back in the old days, we got paid for that ingredient. Now, and we, like I was working in Cambridge in the 90s at John Harvard's and we were paying, or the farmer was paying us $100 a month to pick up our grain. Now I spend $1,000 a month just to get rid of it. And it's free food for the farmer, um, but uh, it's not really free because he has to pay and have resources to come and collect it and deal with it. But, um, but it's a big ordeal for all of us. I can't imagine what some of these New York City breweries are doing, uh, breweries in places where there are no farms or very few farms. When I was just in New York City last week talking to brewers there, um, they were saying that they no farmer is going to sit an hour in traffic to drive into Brooklyn to pick up grain. So they're they're disposing it through, you know, just another, a different waste stream. Yeah, renewable resources. There's ways to, like, send it through digesters, and, and there are companies that will pick it up. Very expensive, very resource-heavy, but... It, it kind of reminds me of from when I had a restaurant in New York that in the early days of uh, reusing your, your fry oil. Mm -hmm. So fry oil used to be something you had to collect it. You couldn't put, put it down the drain. And you used to, again, have to pay someone to come and, and pump it out. And then next thing you know, people started saying, oh, we want to come and take your fry oil. And at first you weren't really sure of it. Next thing you know, every restaurant I know had a system where you, they gave you this big bucket, you dumped all your fry oil in, they, they accessed it with a hose and pumped it out every week. And they were making money and you didn't have to think about it. So I think much like that, breweries are more than capable. And I would probably say every brewery would be okay if somebody put a tote in their brewery and said, put all your, put all your, all your grain in here and someone will come pick it up. And if someone came, picked it up and made it disappear, they would be okay with that. Mm -hmm. So the, so the, so the idea that there's people there that will do it, what you just said is there. It's just, there's zero infrastructure to, to repurpose the grain. So we gotta, we gotta, we have to do that or else it'll never happen. Just to say this has been a great show. Wow, we went full, full circle. But number one, I wanted to come out and, and see Andrew and be at this little mothership here. Um, and thanks so much for what you're doing. And give a shout out to your, your partner as well. Christian, he's in the other room. <laughs> Christian Stanley. I like to say that, that, that Andrea is the boss and Christian is, what ma is who makes it all kind of happen. I've seen him build break and rebuild things. I, I've seen him welding things that you didn't think could be welded together. 
Um, dude's kind of a mad genius. Let's not kid ourselves. All right. Well, thanks you guys so much for coming. One more time, you guys say your name one more time, and we'll be out of here. Andrea Stanley. Kyle Fiescanero. Matthew Steinberg. And hey, I'm Jimmy Carboni, host of Beer Sessions Radio. Big shout out to our engineer, Armin Spengen. Thanks so much for cleaning this up. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Thanks, guys. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio is supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.